afternoon and all. Okay, so um, hi all. I hope uh, the board is okay for everyone, and um, we can have a look at some more Kasparov games from this time the 1982 Olympiad. Uh, so, okay, so in the 1982 Olympiad, <clears throat> in the games I've selected, actually, we're going to see a, f a few modern Benoni uh, type positions. Uh, with even black employing uh, the modern Benoni. Uh, today, the, the Benoni isn't that popular, but um, it is a really exciting uh, dynamic opening. Uh, in this first game, though, it's not modern Benoni. Sorry to raise, raise hopes for the first game, though. No. The first game, um, let's have a look at it. Um, okay. So it's against Glagoric, Kasparov playing white. D4 and um, okay, so D4, Knight F6 from Gregoric. Okay, C4, and we have E6, so it's an invitation for a Nimzo Indian. Now, uh, a lot of people prefer Knight F3 uh, rather than Knight C3. And the reason of that, you know, the Nimzo engine named after Aaron Nimzovich is an extremely powerful uh, concept, uh, you know, to double the pawns. And a lot of people just, that's why the, if you're going to uh, play the Nimzo engine, you need to be prepared for knight f3, heavily prepared for knight f3. So Xprof plays knight f3, sidestepping that Nimzo engine invitation. And we see b6, which is a very solid move. <clears throat> So black is preparing to Finchetto the Queen's Bishop and exert more pressure on the diagonal and in particular the e4 square soon. So uh, knight c3 and that invites a pin now in any case after bishop b4. So what is Kasparov's plan here? Well he plays queen c2 which means no structural damage is needed. If black plays bishop takes c3 he can recapture with queen takes c3. Uh, Black's not interested in giving up the dark square bishop just yet. Just continues putting more pressure on that central e4 square with this move bishop b7. The pressure also inhibits white from playing e4, which is a move he'd like to play, you know, he or she, if e4, e5, that could be dangerous. But uh, that never happens because black usually keeps that under lock and key, that e4 square. So here. Um, what does Kasparov do? Actually, he loses, he in, rather invests a tempo uh, to play in this position, a3. Okay, and um, Gligoric, by the way, uh, was one of Fischer's um, references often in playing uh, the King's Engine defense. Uh, he's, he's played many brilliant games, on, especially you know, in, in King's Engines, I, I remember. Um, some, some real masterpieces. Um, so here he was lower uh, rated uh, than Sparov. Uh, Karpov and Kasparov on the same team in 1982, a formidable team. <clears throat> so um, Black in this position um, plays Bishop takes c3 and um, Kasparov plays Queen takes c3 and then we see d6 <clears throat> and the usual idea of d6 is basically to play uh, later, you know, usually for e5 with some preparation. Uh, once black plays e5, um, usually white will not want to play d5 because usually c5 is given away to a knight, you know, coming to major c5. So that's the usual plan uh, to get a fair share of the center. Okay, e3, and now black plays knight bd7 and um, this bishop at the moment it's it's kind of locked by its own pawn so it seems logical this next move um, to play b4 so not only maybe inhibiting a slightly c5 giving white the option of b takes or d takes but also this bishop to exert pressure on the diagonal the queen and bishop battery might be useful later so it all looks pretty logical play so far for both sides Black now castled, and uh, we see Bishop B2. So, are there any questions from anyone so far 
on on chess space or any 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 questions so far it looks like fairly logical play um for both sides okay so black now plays this move i mentioned earlier just it seems uh a very logical move black is in no rush here to uh for example play c5 uh, he just plays queen e7 which not only maybe supports c5 but also e5 um, so bishop d3 and there's a choice actually although e5 uh, might be tempting actually no there's there's three pieces here on e5 so it's not tempting actually it's not a lie um, unless black wants to invest in our move with a rook move uh, to try and play e5 instead he chooses c5 and Kasparov now opens up this battery, the Queen and Bishop battery, across the diagonal, which is not too dangerous at the moment. B takes C5. And now a funny looking move. Well, it's quite logical though. Black might be threatening Bishop F3. So White decides, Kasparov decides to retreat the Bishop. So... <clears throat> His opening advantage doesn't seem as pronounced as last week in, in the earlier Olympiad games that we saw last week. He seems uh, to be doing okay, but nothing to write home about at the moment. White does have the bishop there, of course, which could be dangerous, but black has good control of the centre and seems to have quite a comfortable position. Okay, there's a, um, someone's asked, why not take the knight on f3? There was an opportunity to take the knight on f3 at some point. Let's just rewind just briefly. Hang on. Bishop d3. If bishop f3 had been played here, I think g takes, and Kasparov hasn't committed his king yet. So maybe the g file, you know, castle, and that would be quite attacking. You'd see a coordination maybe on the g file. So the, the timing has to be right for black to consider bishop f3. So in the game, we saw c5 and, and this bishop e2 as though... Kasparov, well, after takes, you know, the, the, if the white king ever decides to castle queen side, it's going to be visited more easily now by black's major pieces. So this bishop e2 is, is basically almost an indication that Kasparov's really going to castle king side now. So d5, striking in the center. C takes was played. Of course not knight takes. <laughs> queen g7, mate. Uh, bishop takes was chosen now if e takes um you could lead to an isolated pawn situation if takes that would be an isolated queen's pawn um which which might not be that nice at all nice blockade square if that's blockaded the bishop is behind that pawn this bishop's quality would be questioned so black tries to keep fluid here plays bishop takes d5 now after castles we see c takes b4 okay now a takes b4 is played so black has reasonably good quality pieces i would say and so does white so black can now attack the queen with tempo which might be useful for, for c file pressure uh, but we have to ask you know are there exploitable targets on that c file at the moment not many but white's very solid here Knight b6, but c4 looks as though, hang on, c4, black can get rid of this bishop, saddle white with this bishop, get rid of the bishop here, that might be useful. White can test that c file and c4 in particular. We have a trade of rooks, and now an invitation for another trade of rooks, as though, uh, let's just draw this game, simplify and offer a draw maybe. Kasparov obliges with the second rook exchange. And, um, okay. Over the weekend, I felt bad because I had a similar sort of game where I thought my only advantage might have been after a knight e5 move if I had any time of advantage. And I was trying to model Sparth's uh, huge pressure that we saw last week. But here, after knight e5, actually, in this particular Sparth game, uh, is the pressure on black huge after the opening? Unlike the opponents we saw last week, it seems black's still in the game, a reasonable position. This looks as though it's a as though actually there might be a threat though of knight g4 here like in my game of the weekend that knight's virtually pinned knight e5 brings with it 
some options like knight c6 is in the future if supported by b5 and knight g4 as well so maybe you know knight e5 is the sort of move which you wouldn't expect to bring you a small tiny advantage but often it maybe it does in these sorts of positions knight e5 um okay knight d6 and now white rules out the use of the e4 square with this next move f3 and he's also going to evict the bishop maybe with e4 after queen c2 in fact e4 is played bishop a8 and now this the e5 knight um is not tempted at the moment to play knight g4 in fact this c6 square is marked out a bit and this pawn is restricted a bit with this next move b5 now we see knight f e8 keeping an eye on the sensitive g7 square now this next move queen a4 looks as though it's vacating simply the d4 square for bishop d4 a coordinated attack on the poor little a7 pawn out in the corner there is being picked on okay uh Gregoric counters now in the center with f5 wow f5 trying to improve peace quality across the diagonal this bishop what does Kasparov do actually he doesn't panic to the f5 he looks at the weakness of the last move f5 actually weakens actually e6 a little bit and so he plays now queen b3 targeting that weakness of the last move why not but he has taken away the target you know if that was the idea a7 that's for the moment that's put on hold that plan queen c8 protecting e6 okay um and now Kasparov takes on with e takes f5 okay now if knight takes f5 i believe this might be unplayable another weakness of the last move this c4 bishop c4 here might be strong that battery looks mighty here um but black plays a check now and plays another attacking move king goes it doesn't go to h1 actually comes to the center and now we see bishop d5 so giving the option of of knight takes f5 perhaps okay so things are going with tempo all of a sudden in this game white's next move is with tempo attacking the queen with queen a3 not minding even the queen's coming off so what will white have in this end game now a lot of things have come off recently so the queen's come off the knights are protecting each other at the moment e takes f5 is played <clears throat> and we see that old little pawn being attacked now again bishop c5 knight c8 is played so maybe we can look forward to blockade it seems if needed but this next move thrusting with the knight gaining more space knight c6 asks some very difficult questions of black if black takes this um knight then uh maybe first check driving the king actually right into the corner let's have a look at that and this black wants to interpose but the king's still going to be driven into the corner and then takes this looks like a big advantage these raking bishops stopping the king coming out and the white king is free to make a tour maybe to attack you know a7 there'll be a lot of pressure in this end game but uh so maybe that's why um bishop takes c6 wasn't played and instead the poor a7 pawn is given up here now with king f7 another move maybe we should uh, check out in this position is why a6 wouldn't be good because uh, if if takes here you, you might think bishop takes c6 
Does anyone know why a6 is bad? <laughs> um, perhaps we can just play knight b4, you know, attacking uh, that. So that pawn looks doomed here. So the pawn was given up basically now with king f7. So a pawn down, this, this is tangible, big, becoming maybe a big advantage for white all of a sudden in this simplified end game. Gorek fights on, he brings the king to the center. Bishop d4, g6, and now the king comes across, g5, g3, keeping uh, black's f4 at bay. Check, king d3. Uh, just one moment, sorry, after knight c4. Okay, now in this position, um, okay, the knight goes back, king c3. So the king is really uh, gonna maybe herd the pawn. f4, king b4. Black takes on g3 h5 is this going to be a counter past pawn for black right bishop f2 stopping any idea of h4 okay knight f5 or is it h4 is renewed isn't it maybe as a threat here the knight supporting h4 now so f4 and now if h4 we you know this might be answered by bishop g4 bishop g4 might be possible so no h3 and if takes maybe bishop takes keeping that pin so um after this f4 g takes was played g takes okay so the bishops are can you know they're attacking if h4 there's bishop g4 again so it's unpleasant for black knight g7 now the king can march on to herd the pawn. Bishop g2. Black's in trouble. Bishop d4 attacking the knight. And here, um, if the knight moves, clearly h5 will drop. So this is getting very desperate for black. He gives up the knight. But this pawn is not going anywhere still. Check and it's eliminated now. Gaspar with two pawns up. Although it's opposite color bishops, this is going to be easy to convert in this position because the king can come here maybe and herd the pawn. We've got this one as well. So black uh, resigned in this particular position. Okay. So let's have a look in this game in overview and summary. Um, so a very popular Queen's engine defense and um, Sproff losing a tempo is getting the two bishops gaining a bit of space on the Queen side inviting for the moment Bishop f3 but it's not accepted because that invitation could backfire on black here but now deciding yes I'll castle King side now Bishop e2 Black keeps fluid and keeps his bishop active, keeps without the isolated queen's pawn by playing like this, bishop takes d5. Now white's advantage doesn't look that great. He's only got the bishop pair, but it's it's a good position nevertheless. The rooks come off. We see this knight e5 giving white a small but nagging advantage with potential threats of knight g4 and knight c6 as if supported. This poor a7 pawn is a bit of a liability in black's position. And it's sort of marked out by the b4 pawn soon, as we see. First, black's pushed back in the center. So the pawn is starting to mark this one. And we almost see this idea of bishop d4 occur, but now this provokes a weakness, at least, this, this threat of bishop d4. Black has to do something soonish. He plays f5. Prof goes now for the e6 pawn and we see some forcing moves now check 
and then the queens come off and then again we see the targeting of this a7 pawn recurring as a theme so knight c6 giving white a clear advantage now so he wins that pawn and the two bishops are able to handle black's potential h pawn here especially after this f4 so black is now becoming helpless um, he's two pawns down now in this opposite colored bishop ending so that was against uh, Gregoric okay let's take another game now from the uh, 1982 Olympiad oh I've just realized um sorry okay so 1982 Olympiad now this is uh, a classic game I didn't know 100% this this was from an Olympia game now I know um, I think John Nunn had just written a book on the, on the modern baloney um, so John Nunn representing England at that time in 1982 playing black against Kasparov plays the baloney which is um, the son of sorrow actually baloney translates to the son of sorrow apparently um, so e6 knight c3 and we see the Bononi, modern Bononi being used by John Nunn okay d5 white plays a really ultra sharp uh, system now after d6 he plays e4 and now this f4 move as though the central avalanche is coming quicker than usual with e5 after bishop g7 not e5 though bishop b5 check a disruptive check now after knight fd7 um well basically this is virtually forced because knight bd7 um it's kind of apparently refuted with e5 uh, it's very very sharp with the idea of sometimes e6 winning the knight so knight fd7 is is usually considered the only move here but still Kasparov's initiative is quite strong here he plays a4 because uh, black wants to stretch later with a6 and b5 so a4 is preventing b5 this this knight is disrupting black's protection of d6 that measly d6 pawn in baloney knight a6 as though the knight either can come to b4 or maybe attack the bishop and put pressure on the center actually after knight f3 it comes to b4 and now Kasparov castles and we see a6 kicking the bishop and here a strange decision uh, what would most of you uh, play here in this position if I give you 20 seconds uh, what would you play here without looking at the score sheet uh, um, They couldn't do you you say e5 e5 hang on your bishops attacked hang on are you sure about that are you sure you don't want to change your mind there bishop e2 from moritz l bishop c4 from mazaz on 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 uh, twitch well, um, actually, I've, I've annotated this game on YouTube. It's a classic um, game, actually. I think it was I, I saw it in, in the chess magazine at the time. It's kind of a, an amazing idea now, um, just not wasting any time with, with a bishop retreat, voluntarily actually giving up um, the bishop. Bishop takes d7. 
Now, sometimes the, the knight can be useful. Uh, if the knight's kept on, uh, the piece quality of that knight increases. If white ever plays f5, then e5 is remarkably weak in this structure because this pawn is on the semi open file. And if you have a nice outpost on e5, that's quite dangerous. So if bishop d7 is to be followed up, it's probably going to be followed up with f5, which would liberate the scope of the bishop across the diagonal, giving it attacking targets. But it's normally not, you wouldn't want to give up so easily uh, one of the bishops. But here, the, you know, there's, there's some key reasons that f5 in particular uh, is, is now, uh, you know, potentially attacking things. And black doesn't really want to play this usually because, you know, fracturing the pawns. So the e5 control has been loosened with this bishop takes d7. A bit surprising. Uh, black castled. And now, actually, we see now the sort of softening move by Sparov. Not giving John much um, choice, actually. Bishop g5. If the queen uh, moved anywhere then f6 uh, would leave the bishop quite of embarrassed over here that's no not particularly hot uh, so actually uh, unless black wants to play bishop f6 that doesn't look nice either uh, he plays actually f6 which looks like a really ugly move uh, to have to play this f6 it's weakening a bit the diagonal actually f6 it hems in the bishop of course temporarily Bishop f4 attacking that measly d6 weakness. So where is John Nunn's counterplay? It looks like a miserable position here. If he if he plays a move like bishop uh, e8, it's it looks sad. Maybe White can consider. Um, well, there's all sorts of things to consider, but you know maybe even knight d2 to c4 is the classic for, uh, but there's probably a lot of other moves as well here so in this position actually it looks it looks a bit strange um, but black plays g takes f5 perhaps this makes things a bit worse he gives up d6 uh, for this little tactical idea to give up the exchange maybe with this or no no actually it's, the idea is not to give up the exchange the idea is simply to uncover an attack now on this bishop. With bishop takes a4, white must react to this because it's attacking the queen. He plays rook takes a4. After queen takes d6 now, a really nifty move. Um, can you spot it if I give you 10 seconds? It's a really nifty attacking move. Um, the, one of the knights is heading to one of Kasparov's favourite attacking squares for a knight. Uh, so if I give you uh, 20 seconds, can you guess White's next move? Um, those of you on, on Play Chesscom, try and avoid looking at the score sheet tab. If you close the score sheet tab uh, for these little tests. Okay. Okay, the knight, one of the knights is heading for a really nice attacking location now. With tempo, actually, knight h4. So this juicy f5 square. This is starting to vindicate that earlier decision of bishop d7. A lot of destruction has occurred after that bishop d7. So f takes e4, offering a pawn, knight f5, squashing the bishop behind its own pawn huge knight queen d7 getting a pawn back for a moment knight takes e4 hitting also c5 if queen takes d5 then there's knight e7 check that would be embarrassing wouldn't it <laughs> uh, so the queen can't take um, so um in fact, if, if knight takes here, then again that tactic would emerge again. Queen takes d5. So forget taking on d5. Black plays king h8. And now knight takes c5. 
So undermining this knight. And it looks pretty terrible actually because it's sort of protecting, um, attacking. If queen takes d5 here, Okay, let's say the game continued. Actually, the game ended here. After knight takes e5, John Nunn resigned. So does anyone know why? If I give you 20 seconds, why does black resign here? L let's imagine um, queen takes d5 was played. It wasn't. Let's imagine queen takes d5. Is white's advantage really uh, huge? Is a winning uh, move here or something? Anyone? Um, so does, how does white win here um, I think I've seen it I think I've seen it actually uh, with my amazing tactical vision <laughs> just kidding but I think I've got it there's a forcing move I think well queen g4 suffers from queen takes c5 check alright I think I've seen it um Actually, there's, there's more than one way out. I think just taking, you know, just taking. Because either um, knight takes now, and you've got check winning the exchange. Uh, that's probably easiest. Or, or even uh, knight e6. So some of you are saying the queen move. Come off it. Really? Queen g4. Look, queen g4, queen takes c5 check. Yeah. Found the game. Yeah, Queen G four. No, no. Just, just taking the Queen looks simple enough, doesn't it? Everyone, Queen takes D five. Convinced? Just say yes. Convinced. Queen takes D five. <laughs> yeah. You just simply take now or or on G seven. Simple. The exchange is enough to win, yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll go on. To, we'll just quickly review. This was kind of revolutionary at the time. Uh, after this game, the, the Benoni, I think, became less popular because this is a really terrible line for Black to face. Uh, this quick. E4 and F4 is really, really dangerous. I think I've won countless games on Blitz in this line. So you play check and you're prepared, you know, to give up the bishop just to speed up F5 and make sure black can't control the E5 square. It was true, you know, devastation. John Nunn had written a book on the balloon. He just got completely crushed like this. Very dynamic, isn't it? The pressure on black. So not given uh, too much of a chance. Um, if if b6, by the way, again, there's, there's no chance even for b6. Queen g4 here um, maybe is strong. It threatens my h6 check. I wonder if King H8 though in this position. Let's go back a second. Hang on. Okay, let's try and just bust B6. So what's the bust for B6? Anyone? If I give you 20 seconds or should we just give up on this one? 
look at it with computers later. Um, so anyway, 20 seconds starting from now, B6. Any ideas? Knight d6. I must. You say knight d6. Uh, which. Like this one. Is that devastating though? I'm not completely sure it's devastating. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe b6 was black's best move if we can't see anything clear. Um, okay, uh, what about actually, you know, uh, if b6. Well, okay, yeah, d6 looks good. Yeah, d6. Yeah. And also, you know, maybe uh, rook a3 is dangerous. To come to G for me. Um, you know, look at this. Where's this bishop going? That looks pretty dangerous as well. Um, <laughs> this is this could happen clearly this could happen yeah so you all underestimated rook a3 a yeah <laughs> rook a3 this is crushing isn't it rook a3 if you play queen g4 yeah doesn't black just play king h8 to stop knight h6 What do you play here then? If Queen G4 is so winning, what do you play here? Because Black can now play. Um, maybe I oh know there's still Knight H6s. Maybe even in this position, maybe this is still a strong, strong plan. All right. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty dangerous position. So for some reason, Black uh, decided to play King H8, and we saw taking. So okay, let's. That was a bit of a crush. Poor John Nunn, poor England team. Oh there. Okay, so let's have a look at another game. From this is from the 1982 Olympiad in Lucerne, Switzerland. Now this game is against Mikhail Suba, which I've seen play against Plaskett once. It was a really amazing, uh, dramatic uh, blitz finish. Plaskett against Suba, Plaskett winning. I think Suba said about Pat's a grandmaster or something <laughs> to Plaskett after. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite funny, you know. But anyway, this is Kasparov against Suba in, in 1982 uh, Olympiad. So, and for some reason, you know, the Bononi was all, all the popular in 1982. So Suba, Mikhail Suba is playing the Bononi as well. We think it's a, you know, generally an unsound opening nowadays. 1982 was really popular. Okay, apparently uh, there's a British I am Quillen who plays uh, Benoni with a lot of success still, I think. So, um, okay. Um, Benoni again. It's, it's, this is Benoni week, you know, son of sorrow. Okay. So, ED, CD, what does Kasparov play here? But look, look at the difference. The knight is blocking the F pawn. Let's have a look at this move order again. What happened here? Black tricked Pork Sparoff into blocking his F pawn. As though he's going to play the Nimzo. The safe mood order for Black, yeah. Knight F3, blocking the F pawn. Now go into Benoni, C5. Now, funny enough, <laughs> had this club match the other week uh, where. Um, 
my good friend Alex was playing against David Sands, who's a bit higher ECF rated. Um, so David Sands is sort of near FM standard feeder ring. Um, but my club captain was saying, actually, look, as black here, the solid moves, forget C5 in solid club chess with the Germans. You know, B6, B6 is more solid. You know, stick to the dull, you know, Queen's Indian territory. Forget the Benoni structure. Why would you forget about the Benoni structure? Because it's son of sorrow. The sorrow starts for back with this D6 pawn. This is the son of sorrow right here, this D6 pawn. Forget about the dreams of the Queen's side pawn majority. White has enough winning trump cards now just with the D6 pawn. Okay, um, I don't want to put you off though. The Benoni's fun. Try it, you know, in Blitz or something. So Knight C3, G6. The D6 pawn is probed immediately. Bishop F4. Black tries, you know, this dream to get the Queen side pawn majority mobilized. That's clamped down as usual with white playing simply a4. Okay. You know, if b5 takes, you know, you've got the nice pins. Standard move, clamp down. Bishop g7. Okay. Now e4, and black is the one wanting to give up the bishop now, like this, to reinforce, you know, a knight maybe to e5 later. The e5 square is key for black. Semi-open fold. This is a nice outpost square. Black doesn't mind sometimes giving up the light square bishop for a knight. Bishop e2. Actually, he doesn't take on f3, though. He just castles here. So he doesn't mind trading this bishop for this one. If, say, knight fd2. Trade off and accept the pressure, potentially, on d6. Because this standard knight c4 is going to put more pressure on d6 soon. One would think after castles queen e7 so pressure on e4 we see the standard knight d2 because the knight usually is going to reroute c4 bishops come off for the moment um knight d5 doesn't work knight d5 otherwise this pit this pressure might be significant at some point something to bear in mind uh, so knight h5. Now maybe you know, you know, maybe you know something like this is is useful, you know, undermining e4 if black has pressure on e4 at some point. But for the moment, okay, bishop moves. Where does bishop move? Goes to e3, and it looks as though black's got a nice position in knight d7. It looks as though e5 is quite a juicy square for black. Is the light square bishop not an important piece in the money? But the light square bishop gets in the way. Black's pawns are on dark squares. The bishop, you know, these pawns are restricting that bishop on c8. So usually it's it's not that bad to get rid of it. Black's key focus at the moment is, you know, queenside pawn mobility, e5 square, semi-open file pressure. The queenside pawn mobility is squashed a little bit more with a5. So if this pawn dares to move. They'll be en passant in waiting here. Bishop, very interesting move now for black. Black might want to try and weaken uh, f4 as well as e5. And plays now a very interesting move, bishop d4. Not only that, if white dared to take then cd, we also give c5 for the knight, putting more pressure on this e file. Uh, trying to emphasize black's trump cards, you know, all these dark squares, similar to an e-file pressure. Nifty move now from Sparoff, seemingly anyway. Uh, he just puts pressure on d4 with this next move, rook a4. Black doesn't want to take on e3, he plays queen f6. Putting more pressure now on d4, queen d3. Now it gets a bit sharp, knight e5, attacking the queen. The queen doesn't have to move here. Bishop takes d4, pinning the knight to the queen. Which turns out to be a set of exchanges now. Knight takes d3, bishop takes, knight takes. 
So still we're left with this measly pawn on d6 to attack. And finally it's attacked now safely, knight c4. Protecting also b2. So attacking and defending. Rook a d8. The knight's evicted. Goes to b4. So who stands better here? Do you prefer white or black? Do you think black's got enough counterplay or it's pretty miserable? If I give you 20 seconds, let's do an evaluation here. So do you think, who do you think's better, white or black? Anyone? So white belly, yeah, white belly. Yeah, d6, you know, that d6 is a real pain, isn't it? Um, okay, so white's better. I think that's the general agreement. Isn't it interesting, though, that Kasparov doesn't mind the queens coming off. He's not terrified about end games. Um, if he's got a structural weakness to attack, he doesn't mind the pressure coming off with exchanges. But look at what he's done. You know, he's, he's bound these pawns, aren't they? They're restricted. It's clamped down on. The, the queen side majority uh, trump card has been squashed. The e file trump card remains something to be worried about. White's trump cards, the pressure on d6, though, looks quite evident. Rook d2 is played now, keeping the knight maybe out of c2. Knight e8. And now this rook comes back. Knight c7, rook e1. As though maybe even e5 is on the cards at some point. King g7, b3. As though maybe, you know, maybe knight b2 to d3 if this knight wants to be challenged. Possibly. Rook f8. Now look, it looks as though f5 might be on the cards because of this pin. G4, interesting move, G4 is played here. Trying to sort of prevent maybe black, discourage black from, you know, maybe taking this G file could be useful. Rook D7 as though, you know, maybe uh, double up rooks at some point once this pawn is protected. F3, might be five, protecting D6, attacking uh, C3. Not minding, it seems, knight b5 takes. That will dislodge the knight anyway. But uh, knight e2 now. Funny enough, in this position, f5 is played here. Knight takes. takes. Now knight g4, securing that center a bit more. But uh, leaving white with... Um, it seems okay the liberation is, is a long way off is it e5 because black's got a lot of pressure on d5 against the e5 but he's got this nice knight coming in potentially a nice rook you know the king's a bit exposed here king h8 rook f1 so these rooks are like free maybe to come down or down to, coming to g2 is useful knight d4 okay b3 is attacked Xmarf gives up b3 plays rook g2 interesting because actually he can counter attack now this d6 with knight f5 so he's attacking d6 with both knights rook f8 Okay, so d6 is taken, and now we've got two connected pass pawns. Oh! Rooks come off. Kasparov loses another pawn. Tactically, because knight takes, there's rook takes. So, did he blunder here? Okay, he's a pawn down, but uh, he's got a really nice move now. 
Uh, can you spot it if I give you uh, uh, 10, well, 20 seconds? What does white play here, a pawn down? It's nice, the king's restricted, that's a bit of a clue. So 20 seconds starting from now. Anyone? Okay. Okay, yeah, knight e5, nifty move. Uh, so it takes, you know, knight f7 is mate, actually. Yeah. You know, that would be mate. Um, and in any case, not just winning the rook. Uh, so knight e5, so the rook goes to g7. We have a forcing sequence. Check. 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 Winning the exchange now, if he wants. Check. So he can take the exchange, but actually, Xpath maybe finds an even better move. He plays knight takes b7, leaving two pieces attacked. Knight d3 is played. So going into this ending two knights versus rook now, with these two pawns being very mobile, and these, rook, these knights are going to help these two pawns. So it looks pretty pretty crushing. The pawns move. Check. Check. And here black resigned actually. It looks as though e6 is really strong. Uh, with like the knights coming in for the kill. Black resigned here. So um Okay, so that was interesting. So Benoni, um, the the pressure on d6 persisted. It seems into even uh, the end game after the queens came off. So it wasn't the sharp uh, bust line, but still, it's still some problems for Black after these queens came off. So d6 being probed. Now, interestingly, um, g4 and f3. So we have soon um, this transaction where the b3 pawn is swapped for d6. Because getting rid of this d6 means more mobility in the center. These pawns want to go forward. So trading off b b3 to d6, not bad idea in retrospect. So we got pawn mobility. Okay, we sack a pawn for knight e5. Looks nice. Optionally, we can win the exchange. That's not taken. Instead, knight takes b7, uh, forcing this horrible scenario where the pawns are mobile and the knights can participate. Okay, so black resigns here. Right. Uh, Let's have a look at another game from this Olympiad. So this time the US team had Lev Albert playing for them. I don't know how many of you have seen any of um, Lev Albert's games. He was 2565 at the time of the game apparently. Um, so he was playing white and Okay, we get to see a dynamic uh, King's Indian in this game. C4, Kasparov playing black plays G6. I oh, was speaking this on the weekend actually. You see this G6 move? Unusual, isn't it? G6. Or is it? You see, Kasparov, no, no one usually plays. Uh, you know, if it was D4, no one usually plays g6 uh, it's usually either knight f6 or d5 to d4 but this is sparse like you know to, to c4 g6 is, is better because sometimes you can put this knight on e7 carry on like that play f5 and one go 
or the knight can come to f6 in one go so the point is this f pawn could be useful okay so um d4 bishop g7 but now now we go back into king's engine territory uh, so knight f6 the knight does block the f pawn e4 d6 king's engine standard stuff of the castles not the main line but bishop g5 Averbach Petrosian type systems so we see here um, knight bd7 oh this is a funny game okay so queen c1 so Albert's interested in exchanging off the dark square bishops and um, going for a hack attack and I do wonder um, I don't know it looks a bit too crude doesn't it Queen c1 did he have a late night with the team the night before or something and uh, I don't know it looks a bit crude this plan against Gosorov I don't know what do you guys think this plan here Queen c1 Kasparov, he goes now for a sort of Benko Gambit type position. He plays c5. And now b5. Sort of making it a sign of nice Benko Gambit style position. After c takes a6. I love this sort of position. Really dynamic. After a4, queen a5. Immediate problems for white knight, knight e4. With the king still in the center. Bishop d2. After a b, knight takes b5. Queen b6. Okay. The e pawn's hanging at the moment. It's queen c2. Protecting it. Bishop a6. And now, um, funny enough, uh, Albert casually plays uh, knight f3 here. Uh, whoa! So this this allows a kind of thematic looking sacrifice. After the bishop takes b5, usually you don't want to give up this bishop lightly. But here, guess what Kasparov plays here? If I give you 20 seconds, can you spot a good move for black in this position? Anyone? right yeah okay you can give up the queen for rook and bishop and maybe other goodies coming your way queen takes b5 so bishop and rook will check is it enough really is it enough another goodie can come out your way now knight takes e4 Okay, so clearly, uh, if queen takes, then rook takes, um, and then that rook. So white castles, is it really enough, though? You know, all we've got is rook and bishop, isn't it? Okay, so knight e f6. Uh, so let's take stock here. Um, so three, four, five, six, but these are doubled. Three, four, five, six. It's just rook and bishop uh, for queen, isn't it? How would you guys assess this? Uh, do you think black's doing fine? D5 is a bit weak. Interesting. Okay. Well. White uh, ignores d5 here. 
Um, if he plays something like rook d1, I think just knight b6 anyway is, is going to pick up d5. So b4 offering d5. Bishop d2. Rook supporting the other one. B takes, and then the rooks come off. One pair of rooks. Check. Knight takes c5. So it's now a pawn as well as rook and bishop. And these knights look quite frightening. And this coordination looks good. Okay. White starts to get in trouble soon. Uh, it looks as though white's quite passive. The king's kind of exposed. So there's good practical chances uh, for black. And I can't see many practical chances for white to coordinate here, actually, myself. So white's uh, struggling, it seems, even though he's got the queen. Um, so queen c4, e6. The knight's not going anywhere. b6, offering the pawn for queen b5. The knights protect each other. So it's now two pawns. Oh, there. Two pawns, rook and bishop for queen. Bishop e3, and now bishop f8. Okay, tries to get some coordination going between knight and queen. Maybe. Check. Check. E5, driving the knight away. Or is it to c6? Check. 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 Annoying. Rook a6. So now with rook a6, there might be rook b6 on the cards. So maybe come back again. Bishop takes, knight takes. So okay, we have this purer version now that it's like rook and bishop versus the queen, but there's two extra pawns as well. This d pawn in particular seems to have a future here. Maybe. G3, check, and now knight e6. Okay, so queen b8. So here, uh, of course, there's knight e7 uh, on cards, f d5. Uh, rook d1, as though actually the pawn might be coming up. Queen b2. Rook d5, as though the rook's interested maybe in rook c5, chase this guy away. In fact, rook c5 does occur. Check. Knight c8. Okay, if d5 here, queen e5 check. So carefully protecting the pawn again. Attacking the rook, rook moves. Knight b6, stopping again d5. Okay. Knight c5, as though knight e4 is now on the cards, hitting f2. Knight c4 hitting the rook, the rook moves, knight e3, again clamping down on d5. Bishop e7, as though maybe uh, bishop g5 is on the cards. h4 depriving bishop g5, okay. h5 for the moment. So is white trying to hold this, knight d5, bishop d8, offering bishop as a decoy to get rid of that knight. King comes in, knight e6, protecting uh, the bishop, tying queen down it seems, and also e4 might be on cards. There's king stepping out, it looks a bit risky. Queen c6, rook d2. Okay, and now there's a threat all of a sudden of knight d4 winning uh, the queen. Knight d4 check. King moves out of that. But this pattern is repeated with this deflection, rook e2 check. So if takes, then knight d4 check. King d3, but now e4 check. Looking a bit dangerous. Uh oh. White's suffering here now. He's losing the knight, isn't he? Check. The knight's been lost. Oh dear. Oh no, it's going to be three pieces. 
versus the Queen. What's happened? Three pieces versus the Queen. Check, check. And here, White resigns. I think he's gone into a mating net, I assume. If the King goes back, uh, forward rather, anywhere. It looks as though it's mating net time. Can anyone see uh, the mating net? Uh, probably uh, rook c7 looks good. I'm not sure if it's best. Bishop f6. This looks as though rook e7 is weaving the mate. Oh dear. The queen's a bit hopeless. Oh dear. That was a downward spiral for white in that game. Probably a lot of practical time pressure came into it. Uh, but it seems easier to play for black. So dynamic queen sack. Um, let's have a look at that again. In overview and summary. Okay, so it sort of went into this queen c1 sort of asked for a Benko gambit type position. And we see a classic um, kind of thematic sack. Uh, so it smashes white's center, leaving d5 also weak. And it's difficult for white to play, even though you might think rook bishop, but it's very difficult for white to play this position. So the centre is blacks. Um, it's almost trying to liberate um, for the d5 push. White's locked that down for quite a few moves, that d5 push. But uh, eventually it seems this bishop d8 is nasty. Uh, leaving you know the queen kind of restricted and tied down. Um, Okay, and now the king is, is a liability, major liability. Um, you might wonder, you know, if it went back to g2, maybe if it went back to g2, what, what would have happened? Does anyone know? See, I, I think in this position, bishop takes h4 might be on the cards. Tactics like this. Bishop H four. I don't know. So if Queen takes D six, okay. Let's, let's have a look. Uh, King G two. Bishop H four. Queen D six. Yeah, maybe not bishop h4. So after king g2, what would black play here? Maybe knight c5, you know. If queen d6, now there's rook f2, isn't there? So knight c5 looks interesting yeah it looks it still looks difficult for white then doesn't it after knight c5 so for some reason the king did venture out with king e3 and got in real trouble um, so that's something to maybe analyze uh, with an engine or, you know, or something or king g2 I'll put this on YouTube. You'll see all the, the PGNs of what we covered um, on YouTube. Com King's Crusher. If you want to analyze this, King G two. The, once the king got in trouble and White ended up losing a, a third piece, that was it, really, wasn't it? I'm mating that soon after. So um, I hope you enjoyed this week. Uh, we could carry on, um, but I'm. Uh, next week on on the game we missed out the cautionary games are classic the sarapu game uh, less less so but the cautionary game and the sarapu game we can carry on next week maybe so i hope you enjoyed this week this was the 1982 olympiad uh some kasparov games from that i think he's quite inspirational to check these dynamic games and it seems you know he's, he's prepared for the endings you know with queens coming off he's still got the pressure okay
Okay. Thanks very much. So I'll see you next week. Uh, thanks very much. Have a good uh, week. Okay. I'll put it on YouTube.com. Check out, you know, YouTube.com. King's Crush will upload the PGNs and everything there in the description of the video. Okay. Thanks very much.